Hi, I'm Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. And I want to welcome you to a brand new season of programming for the Friends of the LBJ Presidential Library. While we had expected to welcome you back to the LBJ Library by this time, here I stand in my own library. But while COVID-19 has changed for the moment the way we live, it hasn't changed our commitment to bringing you the very best in public programming. To that end, we have a great season ahead for you. On October 1st, I'll be in conversation with the legendary Washington Post journalist, Bob Woodward, who will talk about his smash new book, Rage, about the Trump administration. A week later, on October 7th, we'll feature former Secretary of State James Baker, along with authors and preeminent journalists, Peter Baker of the New York Times and Susan Glasser from the New Yorker, We'll discuss their new book on Secretary Baker, The Man Who Ran Washington. On October 21st, we'll have as our guest, attorney, and co-host of ABC's The View, Sunny Hostin. We'll talk about her new memoir, I Am These Truths. And on December 3rd, we'll host author Julia Swag and CNN's Kate Bennett, who will be on hand to explore the rich life and enduring legacy of Lady Bird Johnson. But tonight, Along with our partners at the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History, we welcome consultant, television commentator, and author, Susan Eisenhower. We'll talk about her new book, How Ike Led, about the stalwart leadership of her grandfather and our 34th president, Dwight Eisenhower. As Henry Kissinger said of the book, it brings one of America's most remarkable public figures into lasting focus. Signed copies of Susan's book are available through the store at LBJ, which now offers curbside pickup. Moderating tonight's discussion is Dr. Leonard Moore, the Vice President for Diversity and Community Engagement and a professor of American history at the University of Texas at Austin. Thanks for joining us and thanks to our sponsors, St. David's Healthcare and the Moody Foundation. And now please join me in welcoming Susan Eisenhower and Leonard Moore. Good evening, my name is Leonard Moore from the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm here uh, interviewing the, a phenomenal author, uh, Susan Eisenhower. We'll be talking about her latest book, How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. Good evening, Susan, and welcome to Austin virtually. Well, Dr. Moore, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm a little embarrassed. I've been a history professor for 24 years and this is probably the most I've ever read about your grandfather, Eisenhower. <laughs> and so, um, fascinating book to read. You know, you are, you are an amazing writer. You know, I, I, I like the, the rich details uh, of your stories. Um, and as we get started, I just want to throw out a general question to you. Mm -hmm. You know, your book is about how Ike led, it's about leadership. And, you know, one thing I ask my 500 first year students every fall semester, can leadership be taught or is it innate? So when you look at the life of your grandfather, was he just born with this or, or, or do you think it was taught? Well, Dr. Moore, I think that's an excellent question and that's going to be one of the enduring questions that exist in the leadership field. Mm -hmm. But let me say that in my book, I draw a distinction between being an operational leader and a strategic leader. Um, and so I think that uh, leadership skills can be taught, but it might require some kind of uh, cognitive capabilities to be a strategic leader. Okay. All of the operational experience Eisenhower played into his capacities as a strategic leader, but a strategic leader has a very different set of uh, considerations. He's got to be, he or she has to be pulling uh, a wildly diverse group of inputs uh, together to create a coherent uh, grand strategy for any effort underway. And he had talent at actually being able to connect dots uh, and over the course of uh, uh, a long consequential career, uh, he managed to develop principles about how to strip down complex problems uh, into uh, the essence uh, of the issue to then move forward. So I think it is a combination of the two, which is not a very satisfying answer, but I think that's probably where I come down on it. No, and in your book, I, I really love how, you know, you go through his childhood. You talk about his brothers and, you know, and growing up in Abilene, Kansas. So if you could point to one, maybe one incident or one experience 
in his childhood before he goes to West Point that you may say, you know, this, this moment right here, I believed um, is where he illustrated that he had the ability to go ahead and be a national leader. Anything in his childhood that stands out to you? Any experiences? You know, the Abilene High School uh, yearbook mm -hmm. suggested that he might become a renowned history professor at Yale. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, that didn't quite happen. His brother, by the way, Edgar, was seen as uh, possibly having a two-term presidency. Okay. So uh, it's, it's, it's rather funny. I think um, Ike, though he was uh, very athletic, uh, and very personable, uh, had an introspective side too. He, he did love history, which is fortunate because many of the principles he developed over time related to what worked and what hadn't worked in the past. Um, in any case, I think Ike would tell you that one of the most important events that occurred in his childhood uh, related to his um, uh, passionate, you might even say volatile uh, inner space. As a kid, uh, he sensed injustice in a very strong way, and um, he was known among family members to have occasional spectacular meltdowns, as we call them today. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, there was one incident when he was a young boy. His two older brothers were allowed to go out trick-or-treating, yeah. uh -huh. um, and he became enraged that he was, according to his parents, too young to join in the fun. Uh, so he was outside at the time and he started beating his hands against a tree until his hands uh, drew blood and um, he just, he was so angry, he almost blacked out. So of course, um, David Jacob Eisenhower probably got out the hickory stick and whooped him a bit <laughs> because that's what they did in those days. Right, and right. Uh, he was sent up to the room he shared with the two brothers who were out, out on the town, which probably made everything even worse uh, for him. But as he um, uh, lay in bed and it was uh, moving towards dusk, his mother came up and told him uh, that he only hurt himself and wasn't it obvious from looking at his hands. Uh, probably his brothers didn't know he felt resentful. They're out having a good time, sure, but who actually got hurt here? And then she started quoting the Bible because it was a very religious, by the way, pacifist household. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, he who conquereth his soul is greater than he who taketh his city. And, you know, I like to reflect on that because I, I really believe that if he had not learned how to discipline his <clears throat> inner self, uh, his inner life, uh, that he would have never taken a continent, um, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, right. literally. Um, developing so, so, that inner space enabled right. him uh, to uh, rise to leadership positions because, um, his mother it had such an extraordinary impact on him. Let, let me follow that up because in, in your, I mean, I love how you talk about his experience at West Point. You said he wasn't <laughs> the, top, the top in his class. He challenged authority and you said he almost got kicked out of West Point. So was some of that rebellious streak still in him when he went to West Point? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that he uh, almost got kicked out. He had a higher than average uh, academic record. Uh -huh. And he was a little bit below 50% in discipline. And okay. I think that's because at that time, he didn't know how to handle failure or disappointment, mm -hmm. uh, or he was learning how to do that. Let's put it that way. He uh, was a, a great athlete and was a, an important person on the West Point football team. As a matter of fact, he even played in the Army Carlisle game against uh, Jim Thorpe. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, I know, exactly. Wow. And he, he okay. really took his athletics seriously, a leftover from life in Abilene, Kansas. And he, but in the course of this football career, he broke his knee and uh, had trouble with his knees, his whole, uh, that particular knee his whole life. Uh, but he, he then was off the football team. Uh, he helped a lot with coaching. I think he even became a cheerleader, but uh, to the extent that he could do that with a bad knee. Uh -huh. But he... You know, this made him very unsettled and he had a hard time getting a grip. I just descri described a bit his emotional life. Um, and then, um, so he did graduate. Uh, he, was gra he graduated as a very, very popular cadet. Uh, and they seemed to understand at West Point that despite the growth that was still to happen in this young man, um, that he had leadership qualities. It was later in the army where he thought that the way the army was using tanks was crazy, right. uh, that he wrote a couple of very controversial articles that almost got him a court-martial. Right. 
Now, um, let me ask you this real quick. So, so he, right, I, I remember that you, you write vividly about that. And my question was, he loved to challenge authority, right? You know, mm -hmm. did he allow people under him to challenge his authority? Yes, actually, okay. um, one of the things I found absolutely fascinating in my research is uh, the scholarship about the war, and, and many scholars rightly say it must have been extremely trying to have all of these alpha male personalities um, around General Eisenhower, who all had very different views um, about uh, what our uh, allied strategy should be, whether they're getting enough resources, whether they had enough authority, and he got this pushback all the time. He not only got the pu uh, pushback from his subordinates, he was getting you know, he had to keep uh, his bosses happy. That would be Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill and, and George Marshall, of course, who's chief of staff of the army. What's fascinating is that he takes the model of the war years and brings it with him to the presidency. So he is surrounded by people, including, by the way, his two brothers. He had a very, very conservative, I'd even say right wing, older brother, Edgar, and um, a liberal brother Milton Eisenhower, and they were always at each other. And Ike was the middle of the rotor there, no question, but he loved, when I say loved, he demanded that kind of pushback. Because um, like all good military men, the one thing that you're terrified of is allowing your own default assumptions to go unchallenged. Because mm. if you do at that level, um, then all you're doing is playing into your um, preconceived ideas. And the pushback actually gives you an opportunity to see an issue in a multidimensional way. Right. I know in the, in the, in the part of the book, we talk about the Normandy invasion. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, talking about leadership, you know, there's a story you relate. Um, uh, they were planning the, the, the invasion. I guess this person was over the airborne people. And he basically told, I think, I, you know, this ain't gonna work. You know what I mean? And and I think in, you, in the book, you write down that, that Ike wrote a letter basically stating, you know, it, 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 so if it didn't work, the per, that person wouldn't be responsible for it. And so to me, it's, 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 it's just an amazing story of he's allowing one of his, you know, subordinates to say, you know, um, I, uh, Eisenhower, this is not going to work. But Eisenhower having so much respect for that gentleman you know, to say, well, let's put it on record in case it doesn't work, you won't be blamed for it. And right. like, you will look like a hero. Can you talk about that for a minute? I mean, I think well, you need to get the book. Yeah, no, you. it's so, wonderful. Amazing. He said he wanted to protect um, Air Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, who mm -hmm. made a very serious recommendation. The problem was, is that the airborne troops uh, that he suggested General Eisenhower should not use at the last minute because of um, uh, German uh, movements within the area, uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, those um, paratroopers were critical. They were the linchpin of the Utah Beach and Omaha Beach operation, uh, which of course was one of the key elements of uh, the entire assault on the Normandy coast. Mm -hmm. And Eisenhower decided that despite Lee Mallory's warning that 50 to 70 percent of these troops would be lost, yeah. Eisenhower decided that he had to use them and he was just literally praying uh, that the planning had been good enough and that the conditions would um, make it possible for these troops to be successful. As it turns out, we lost between four um, and as much as 10% over, um, over the execution of the entire uh, Normandy um, uh, campaign, which is way lower than the 50 to 70%. Nevertheless, Ike on June 5th, as troops were ready uh, to assault the coast of Normandy, wrote a note for his wallet, <laughs> for himself, and to be released in case of failure, that accepted um, singular responsibility um, if the entire invasion should fail. And that even included, by the way, the weather forecast. He was taking personal responsibility <laughs> for the weather forecast. Right. Um, and, and rightly so, as I point out, because it was his decision to go on that day and at that time. Right. Um, and, and, and one thing you point out in the book, what, what I get is that, you know, great leaders make a decision and own it. And even, you know, I think Ike had something and I wrote it down. He said, you know, if you make a mistake, admit it. If you make an error, admit it, uh, spell it out, you know, tell the entire story. Can you talk about where that came from, this thing of I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to own it, and, and it's all going to be on me? 
Well, I think that there's certainly a good bit of that in the military culture, though I, say, I must say that I think he, he took it to a higher level, as it were. I don't uh, know that other generals were uh, ready to uh, accept full responsibility for their portion of the uh -huh. um, operation, though they might have. He just really believed that if uh, he fought for the enlargement of uh, the, the Normandy uh, force structure, he, he argued for uh, changes to the original plan. And so the D-Day plan really was his. And he didn't see how anybody else could be blamed. There's another uh, interesting uh, moment later in his presidency when the U-2 is shot down. The U-2 was an aerial reconnaissance uh, plane that was developed to assure that we would not suffer a surprise nuclear attack at the hands of the Soviet Union. Um, and he uh, gave the order for that uh, flight to uh, occur uh, several weeks before the Paris summit. In any case, the Soviet Union shot it down and then made a huge performance over uh, these overflights, even though they knew that the overflights had been occurring for some years and had been offered the opportunity to do it, uh, uh, overfly the United States. Um, in any case, Eisenhower took full and complete responsibility for the uh, mistake he made, we made, um, because he wanted the Soviet Union to know uh, that he had control over his government and that these decisions were his and his alone. So you see this pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, could I add one more thing, Dr. Moore please, here, please. which is really wonderful as uh -huh. a leadership uh -huh. uh, principle, you might say. He is quoted many, many times as saying a, a command or a, a leader's role is to accept all the blame for the mistakes of his subordinates and to give all of his subordinates uh, the credit uh, for uh, for the op for a successful operation. Right, right. Uh, that takes a lot of uh, humility to do that because most people feel compelled somehow to make sure that their picture is in the frame as it were, but uh, he, he didn't feel that necessity. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's, well, we're still on the World War II topic. I, am amaz I was amazed at reading the book about how after the war was over, you know, he toured several Nazi concentration camps. And he wanted to pe he wanted people to see it because in the book you said he made a quote that in future years people may attempt to deny you know that this event occurred. How could he even have the the the, the foresight right to to understand that there would be Holocaust deniers you know after after World War II? Well, I must say that one of the things that struck me about him in his developing and maturing career was to notice that he really was uh, a person who studied uh, the people around him. He was an observer of men. Mm -hmm. And I think by the time he gets to this point, and, and by the way, uh, this would have come from his childhood too. His mother was always saying, how do you think it looks to the other person? Mm -hmm. You know, and we got that in spades as kids, I'll tell you. <laughs> we were always being asked by him, and how do you evaluate this from the other person's standpoint? Um, so with that kind of um, uh, sensitivity to other people's viewpoints, I think he had a, a sense that it's just human nature that something so horrendous uh, as the Holocaust would be denied. And he wanted to make sure that it was chronicled in every way possible before uh, the post-war settlement uh, you know, came into effect. Um, he asked for everybody who was not at the front uh, to go through these camps. He asked General Marshall to uh, produce um, journalists and members of Congress to come observe this. And really the record we have of the Holocaust is pretty much thanks to him. Um, if I could add one more thing which sure. struck me is that he had this capacity to see far out and he was always uh, interested in the long game, um, interested in, and driven for that. So after the war, and he, uh, they signed the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany, Ike looks at his staff and says, if Germany is a prosperous democracy 50 years from now, we will have succeeded. Oh, wow. wow. Um, so uh, anyway, that struck me, and I think that was very much behind the Holocaust. Thank you for mentioning that, because um, how to solve the um, the, terrible, terrible uh, circumstances that the Jews have been subjected to was a huge um, issue, pressing issue after the war, because 
they were homeless. And they, among uh, so many others on the continent of Europe, uh, were homeless. And that was another uh, long-term issue that had to be sorted out. So, so, so your grandfather goes from, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, leading troops in World War II, then I think over NATO, then he becomes president of Columbia University. Now, I can't think of two, <laughs> two institutions that are t so opposite than the military with a strict hierarchy and then an academic setting, with all, this, all this academic freedom. So, so number one, did he enjoy being president? And number two, how did he take his leadership skills from the, from the battlefield and bring them to the halls of the academy? Oh, oh, that's, I, I love the way you said that. Actually, you know, I, it's so well said. I, I just, uh, uh, we, we'll put an exclamation point on that idea. Yes, the military is very hierarchical, but, you know, Ike really loved his G, GIs, and he was out visiting them all the time. He had such an interest in, in young people, and as uh, the post-war uh, began to develop, it was very clear that it was going to be an extremely turbulent time, and there were lots of challenges even to um, the United States that was suffering labor disputes, high inflation, we were in the Korean War and all of this. And, and uh, Ike really believed that education was absolutely critical for um, a functioning democracy. So he loved that part of it. Um, he also uh, truly believed though, he was much more, uh, he was less hierarchical than almost any of the other generals uh, under his command. And um, he, he gave a wonderful talk to the um, the maintenance staff uh, at Columbia about the um, interdependency of our jobs. And, and he told them that the work they were doing was absolutely indispensable um, and that uh, I rely on you and you rely on me. And this, this kind of holistic way of um, looking at uh, leadership, I think, helped him survive much of the, the Columbia experience. I think the professors were a little bit dubious, like, uh, how do we end up with a, you know, a five-star general here? But there are two things to be noted about. Number one, uh, Columbia University was in some rather difficult financial circumstances, so Eisenhower helped raise a lot of money for the university that put it back on solid footing. And secondly, it was uh, transformational for him in terms of um, appreciating uh, expertise. Uh, he, of course, he had that from the war, you'd have to do that. But he really develops um, a close personal relationship, especially with the scientific community, bringing many of those professors from Columbia University to uh, his White House uh, after the inauguration in 1953. All right, now let, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, Ike and McCarthy, all right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm reading it, you know, um, you know, because you're, 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 you're taking the book is that he didn't want to challenge McCarthy, because he didn't want McCarthy, he didn't want to give McCarthy additional publicity. But no. could it be argued, Susan, that Ike silenced for so much of that McCarthyism period, allowed McCarthy to ruin lives? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it can be argued that yes, but Truman did attack McCarthy, and it didn't help. As a matter of fact, uh, because uh, Harry Truman attacked, and, and, um, and it wasn't just Harry Truman, uh, the administration um, uh, did as well, okay. um, it, it, it elevated him in a way that he didn't deserve to be elevated. He was a junior senator from uh, Wisconsin and, and not uh, a senior senator or in leadership positions uh, at all in the Senate. So. Um, uh, understanding that that approach didn't work might have been um, somewhat influential in Eisenhower's decision, but I'm so glad you asked this question after I just got done saying that he um, uh, understood constitutionally the three co-equal branches of government. Let's not forget that he had absolutely no control over censuring um, Senator McCarthy. Uh, so, uh, and since he had a tenuous uh, grip on the majority, uh, in Congress at that point, which, um, you know, he, he lost in 1954, um, in order to get other key legislation through, he had to uh, find a way to work behind the scenes, which is what he did. Now, to your point, yes, I think that it, it was extremely frustrating that Ike would refuse to give McCarthy the one thing McCarthy wanted. Uh, again, that is kind of a military principle. You don't, you don't play your enemy's game, right? Mm -hmm. You make sure that you're depriving them 
of success at every turn. Um, he really, uh, he was visceral about how much he disliked this man. Um, and so um, the decision not to use the quote unquote bully pulpit as we think of it today is really uh, not quite accurate because he used the bully pulpit on this issue, but he didn't name names. Right. Um, and uh, he, would, he would talk about general uh, principles like um, he said, uh, you can't destroy. You can't. Um, you can't defeat communism by destroying America. Mm -hmm. He'd say things like that. Um, now, uh, there's one other factor here too: is that um, the no personalities principle, whether you like it or not, it's Ike. So you know, we have to say that you don't have to like it. But I'm trying to explain who he is. <laughs> he he had the feeling that if you insulted your opponents personally, it would make them double down yeah. in their efforts. Th that, is um, a great, that is a great leadership strategy. And I was reading it. I'm like, okay, I got to quit talking about people in public, you know? <laughs> but well, that is a phenomenal. <laughs> and, th and then one thing you talked about, I mean, to cut you off, you said that he would not in many ways um, um, uh, damage the dignity of his office as president by coming down and, and, you know, get going in a back and forth. Can you talk about that for a minute and getting in a back and forth with McCarthy? Well, Ike's uh, idea not to uh, use personalities and to talk about Senator McCarthy um, specifically drove a lot of people straight up the wall. Uh, his uh, youngest brother, Milton Eisenhower, advised him to take uh, McCarthy on. Um, his press secretary was chomping at the bit. This is driving everybody crazy. But Ike, you know, the thing is, he liked the pushback but if he had a strong feeling uh, about something based on you know years of experience he wouldn't uh, he didn't budge on this and um and i think uh it was also informed by the the view that um we needed cooperation during that time we needed to unite the country and you can't unite the country if you're hurling personal insults at people um, um, especially uh, the opposition party. I think the thing that's stunning about um, the McCarthy period is that Ike had a number of very, very serious issues that came before Congress, including something called the Bricker Amendment. We don't need to bother your, <laughs> your listeners with the details of the Bricker Amendment, but this was uh, an amendment proposed by a member of Eisenhower's own party that would curtail the power of the presidency. Um, and, and who helped him out on that but the Democrats? And you see time and time again in the first uh, term of his office, the Democrats helping him uh, with uh, uh, appointments, including um, the appointment of uh, Chip Bowen as ambassador to, to Russia. So now how would he have been able to garner that cooperation if he'd been insulting the opposite party? Not at all. Uh, he was intent on working with them, with Republicans and Democrats. Um, and maybe it's worth... I just think as a leader, it takes tremendous discipline and restraint. Yeah. You know, when you see somebody like a McCarthy, you know, to not go at him, you know what I mean? Just, but you know, in the book you point out that, you know, uh, Eisenhower had other ways he would deal with McCarthy, he basically set a trap for him and let, you know, McCarthy walk into it, you know what I mean? And basically, you know, um, in many ways, you know, damage, damage his own career. Can we, I'll say, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add there that the trap really revolved around putting McCarthy in a situation where McCarthy's colleagues, um, that would be the Republicans because they control the Senate, mm -hmm. that they would censure a member of their own party. And so what he was trying to do the whole time was to demonstrate to those who could discipline mm -hmm. Senator McCarthy that uh, it was inevitable that it had to be done. And, and yes, I mean, I personally, and I know he personally, um, you know, deeply regretted the people who uh, were given a very, very rough ride during that time. Um, but it's hard to imagine how it would have worked any other way because um, other methods uh, had been tried. If you don't control the outcome, like the ability wow. to censure this senator, yes. then you don't, you're not holding all the cards. Woo, um, Susan, that... That is an amazing leadership piece. And, and I'm, I'm digesting all this stuff as we talk. You said if you don't control the outcome, you don't control all the cards. Oh, that is no, uh, right. I may put that on my wall and quote somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Can we shift gears a bit and talk about Ike and civil rights? You know, sure, you know, absolutely. So I, I, do, I teach African-American history and 
you know, even within African-American history, we have overlooked him. You know, you know, we, you know, we'll go to FDR for a little bit, but we jump literally from FDR straight to JFK in 19 and 1960. And I'm just thinking about all the critical African-American events, 1954 Brown versus Board of Education, 1955, the lynching of Emmett Till, 1956, the Montgomery bus boycott, then 1957, Little Rock. So can you talk a little bit about why you think historians, and I, I'm one of them, uh, why you think historians have overlooked Ike's contributions and what those contributions uh, were? Well, first of all, let me say, I think again, it's human nature because after Ike left office, the Democrats assumed the presidency and mm -hmm. they did make um, you know, enormous contributions there. So um, you know, it's inevitable that they would wanna talk about their contributions. I think the reason um, Ike's position on civil rights is a little less known is again, he had a kind of different um, leadership style, number one, but number two, and most importantly, he was a military man. Okay. So now let me explain that for you just quickly um, in one sentence. As a strategic leader in the military, he's always thinking about resources, timelines, who controls, uh, who controls the terrain. Okay. Um, this is a kind of, um, methodology that he is trained for. So he says to himself, I've got eight, um, I've got four to eight years to do something on a subject that's very near and dear to me. And, okay. and it really was, if you read, wasn't it surprising, for instance, to read his first uh, State of the Union address, Absolutely. where he commits himself Absolutely. To, de <laughs> to desegregate everything that the federal government controls. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I could, so, I could, he, he said it at a State of Union in DC, basically announcing what he was going to do in DC. I'm sorry, but it, that's it was- right. That's right. No, it, you're completely correct. And so he says, um, I'm starting with the District of Columbia because the federal government controls the District of Columbia. Uh -huh. It was remarkable that the district um, was uh, desegregated without violence. And mm -hmm. uh, he even desegregated um, Washington DC schools before schools. Brown yeah. versus Board of Education. Right. The point was, is that again, as a strategist, a grand strategist, he understood that if he uh, did what he could control, mm -hmm. then he would create a precedent that would make rollback impossible. Got you. Now, this is a very subtle intellectual point, uh, but it takes nothing away from uh, what was in his uh, heart and what uh, drove his determination. Uh, then he goes for federal contracting. He desegregates federal contracting. But, and then of course you mentioned Brown versus Board of Education. Those were, that was his appointment, Earl Warren, who oh, Warren, yeah. contrary to what scholars say, mm -hmm. he admired. I mean, I read his diaries, he admired Earl Warren mm -hmm. and he admired Earl Warren for this particular um, uh, ruling on, uh, on Brown. Mm -hmm. um, uh, anyway, I've got that, uh, uh, that chapter uh, yes. footnoted to uh, assure people that I, I didn't dream this up in the middle of the night. Uh, let me just say one other thing, that he went a long way at the end of the war to uh, desegregate units. Um, yes. And he went as far as he could, as far as uh, the federal government regulations and the rest of it. But, um, you know, he really believed that America had a responsibility to make good on its promise. Mm, yeah. And this is a, a big part of it. And may I just also say, Dr. Moore, on a personal note, he had um a valet um who'd been with him since the war who he adored and we all understood that in the family that there was only one indispensable person uh aside from my grandmother and that was sergeant john money hmm. um and sergeant money um i hope that people will take this away a sergeant john money an african-american um uh associate of my grandfather's was the first African-American to be a pallbearer in a president's funeral. And if being African-American wasn't uh, surprising enough for that time, this was a sergeant standing shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of four-star generals. <laughs> and um, that was so moving for me because the two of them were so connected, I mean, emotionally even, uh, that when uh, Ike died, uh, Sergeant John Money didn't last much longer himself. Um, and it's a and and there was nothing um, master servant kind of mm -hmm. thing about it. They had they they did something for each other that was really quite wonderful. And as Sergeant Mona used to tell me, 
he says, you know, your grandfather and I desegregated all the hotels in the South. What? <laughs> um, and what he means by that is that quite literally, if uh -huh. places Eisenhower visited would not allow Sergeant Money to stay in the hotel along with him, then he said he wouldn't go. Wow. wow. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> anyway, well, that's just a little side yeah. note. Uh, and so in the book, you do, you do a great job of talking about how he laid the groundwork for all the civil rights legislation. So what was his relationship like with with LBJ? Well, you know, um, in 1957, uh, Ike um, uh, managed to uh, pass the 1957 Civil Rights Act. Now, think about this. He is a Republican, mm -hmm. and now Congress is controlled by Democrats. Um, and uh, the, the 57 bill actually got watered down. It is correct that those who are writing about it today say that they were Southern segregationists. What's not fair about this is that it was also the Democratic leadership. Mm, okay. okay, the in the 57 Civil Rights Act, Eisenhower vehemently wanted voting rights in that bill. Um, and it was, um, you know, the Southern Democratic leadership, um, including uh, uh, one northerner named John F. Kennedy, who voted against that provision. <laughs> um, but the thing that's moving again for me is that Lyndon Johnson, of course, was, uh, um, the leader in the Senate. Um, and because of their relationship, they got together on this and, and found a compromise that yes, meant that, uh, but when, when um, I've noticed in the newspaper in the last couple of days, because the Eisenhower Memorial, they keep saying that I caved into mm -hmm. Southern segregationists. Well, yeah, the whole Democratic Party, um, you know, um, was dependent on uh, many of those folks at that time. Um, and so it's really a, a great tribute to Lyndon Johnson um, that he and Ike together worked out a compromise that at least made it possible for the Eisenhower bill to be passed so that certain improvements could be made. Um, I think in this respect, we have to look back and put all this into context. Eisenhower wanted to do way more and actually got a bill passed in 1960 uh, that made improvements to the 57 bill. Now, this is what I was most excited about, if I may say so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, after he left office, um, he told John F. Kennedy that he would support Kennedy's civil rights bill, and by the way, made a commitment to call up Republicans in his own party and insist that they support Kennedy's civil rights bill. Um, well, as we know, um, it, it took uh, 1964 for uh, things to really come to that fruition. But then at this time, we have uh, Barry Goldwater, who's running on the Republican ticket. And I told him, if you don't support the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, I'm going to vote for Lyndon Johnson. Wow. <laughs> I got to tell you, um, wow, poor Barry Goldwater listening to Ike's dissertation on that. I, you know, wow. He could be, he could be very tough. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I think it speaks to... Um, the fact that people of goodwill who wanted to see accomplishments could, even at that level, um, do more for civil rights than to defend their own party. Right. Um, and I do so wish that we would have that kind of political flexibility today because our country has so many things it must attend to. Uh, and I hope, actually, Dr. Moore, in writing this book, that I would inspire some people to understand that leadership and strength requires compromise. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I last, know it sounds like last, a radical idea, right? <laughs> last question. If, yeah. if, um, if, if your grandfather was alive and you all were sitting at home, just flipping through CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, what do you think his observation would be about the current political climate? Well, I, I don't know how he could, um, first of all, he was an extraordinarily optimistic person. And what I would say about that, his optimism derived from an almost, um, from a, a tremendous belief in the American people. He had seen what they did during the war. Mm -hmm. They scaled up that wartime, um, uh, the effort, um, ordinary Americans, kids from cities and farmlands went and and fought heroically to win that war. And he deeply believed in our capabilities, but I think he could not help but be deeply uh, worried um, about the fact that we have 
leaders who don't understand um, how perfectly frightening it is that we are as divided as we are. And I would say that uh, applies to um, all sides. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what he would be telling me right now, is start with yourself, okay? How are you talking to people? Hmm. Yeah. How are you behaving? Are you part of this problem? Are you listening to other people? Are you, how does it look to the other guy? No, I can't hear him say right. that. How does it look to the other guy? <laughs> right, right. <No. laughs> and um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I have a lot of faith in this country too, but I think it's not going to happen without some recognition uh, that we need to find um, a new way to solve our problems. That a uh, winner can't take all by right. definition right. in a democracy. Well, Susan, thank you so much. It was it was a phenomenal book. You know, um, you know, it was an easy read for me. I find myself like I was reading a it was a story. And so, thank you for this 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 great uh, addition you've made to you know the history of not only American presidents but also the history of uh, of our country. Thank well, I just so want much. to thank you, Dr. Moore, for a tremendous opportunity to talk to you personally, and I look forward to meeting you in person when we're allowed to gather again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We'll see. Take you. Take care. Bye bye. Right. Thanks to Susan Eisenhower and Leonard Moore. We invite you to support these programs by becoming a member of the Friends of the LBJ Library at lbjfriends.org. You can purchase a signed copy of Susan Eisenhower's book at lbjstore.com. To continue the conversation on President Eisenhower and his legacy, please join us on September 29th for an interactive members-only conversation with Dr. William Hitchcock, professor of history at the University of Virginia. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.